guys can hear me? Hello? <clears throat> You are doing very well. I feel honored to welcome all the participants for taking a key part in this important program. Uh, I'm sure that you will all feel enriched with the knowledge after the completion of this event, or that you will all have a great time ahead. So, now I would like to talk something about our platform. So, this is an online platform which is free and known as the World Literature Webinars, where we invite the most experienced speakers from the different corner of the world and they come and they share their knowledge on their interest uh, their topics <clears throat> so uh, now I would like to talk about our webinar that how we are conduct uh, this webinar so those of you who are new here please pay attention so this webinar is divided into three parts and the first part we will conduct the webinar and then in the second part we will have a question and answer session you will where you will be asking questions from the speaker regarding the topic whatever the question you have you can uh, put question in the uh, comment box and we uh, uh, our speaker will try his best to give your answer so in the last part i will share the feedback form link uh, you have to fill out that form in order to get the certificate after the uh, if you do not fill out the feedback form then you will not be able to get the certificate of the webinar so now without further ado i would like to welcome our today's speaker uh, who is mr email uh, hello sir hello sir adil thank you so much i am very thrilled to to share with our audience my you know simple knowledge about literature so good afternoon once again to you sir adil and um thank you thank so you much sir. for this yeah for this momentous um momentous and surreal opportunity yeah, but allow me to formally introduce to you myself yes sir yes, yes. okay so my name is mr emil yakon and i'm from the philippines i have been I have been in this profession for almost 10 years, nine years and six months to be exact. I am a graduate of Bachelor of Secondary Education major in English and Master of Arts in Literature and Language Instructions, also here in the Philippines. And I am a candidate for Doctor of Philosophy in Education major in Educational Leadership in one of the universities here in, in the Philippines, specifically in, in, in Manila. I have gained experience in teaching English in grade school or elementary. We call it English language arts. I also taught um, research in grade six. I also have gained experience in teaching English communication arts in, in high school. I was also a part-time college professor. I taught testing and, and um, teaching and assessing literature and public speaking, including English American literature. And I am also an experienced ESL or English as a second language teacher. So once again, good afternoon to everyone, to our Pakistani and Indian attendees. Good afternoon to you and to my fellow Filipinos who are with, with us right now, who are tuning in with us. I would like to say thank you for supporting me. And of course, good evening to, to all of you. Yeah, so I hope you can see my screen. So I actually summarize the objectives of this webinar through this learning outline. So we are going to unravel these questions. The first question is, we're going to answer this, what is literature? The second one is, what is literature or literary appreciation? What are the different literary appreciation skills? What are the issues in terms of learners' literary appreciation skills? Who is a 21st century learner? And what is literary criticism? What are the different approaches in literary criticism? And how can literary criticism enhance literary appreciation skills? But allow me to go back 
allow me to go back to the title of our webinar for today. We are going to talk about enhancing the literary appreciation skills of the 21st century learners through literary criticism. So let's proceed. So what is literature? I believe that all of you know what literature is. According to Sir Magulod, he's actually a Filipino, literature is life. Life is actually fluid. That's correct. It is, it is the gateway of looking the world outside. And, lit, and reading literature is the best way to know who we are, what we are, and what we used to be. We can learn, understand, and appreciate the world around us. Also, based on the website English Feeding, literature is an umbrella world, word used to describe a variety of creative works of imagination that may be written or oral. Thus, it is also an imitation of life through an imaginary comparison. But take note, though literature offers a lot, we learn a lot from it, literature is not a faithful record of reality as history is. It means that literature merely copies actual life people and situations. The literature actually encapsulates meaningful experiences of people. Okay? Now, let me continue. There are actually great values of literature. What are these advantages or benefits that we can gain from reading literature? The first one is entertainment, which I do believe that all of you get entertained by literature. Right? I believe all of you read your favorite novels. And so do I. The second benefit is we are able to master a specific language, okay? Most especially in English. Number three, I actually do agree with this one. It's an emotional relief. You know, every time I am in pain, I actually read. And sometimes I produce something. I produce, I compose a poem, which is also a piece of literature or a type of literature. Number four is it is a social control. That's actually a very heavy term. What do, we, what do we mean by social control? It's actually from a realist view or perspective. By the way, realism is, is a philosophy. It helps to enact social change by revealing the truth of society. And through imaginative sympathetic participation, in the experience of a person, you're actually able to what? You're able to um, learn more about the society, okay? Literature also functions as a means of direct experience. Yes, let's say you have not been in Paris, France, but through reading a piece of literature that is focusing on the life of French people, you're able to gain what we call vicarious experience. But we, what you need to do is to, to imagine and uh, imagine that you are there. But that's actually what? That's how you gain a, um, a vicarious experience. Like, for example, when you are watching a teledrama or a teleserie, let's say a Korean a Korean um, series, right? The fact that you class feel the love, the fact that you cry, you're already experiencing a direct experience or what we call vicarious experience. The sixth one is actually true. Literature mirrors life, okay? Like what I said a while ago, sometimes when I feel sad, I write a poem. And some of you actually... We're able to read novels which depict real life, okay, or real experiences of people. Number eight is, or number seven is that literature is a reservoir of culture, which is also correct. Literature serves as a historical document and social document. If I may just give an example, I know you're familiar with the diary of Anne Frank. Right? I can actually see you now on YouTube, your live chat, but I do believe that you know who Anne Frank is. That diary 
is considered to be a historical document because it is the direct experience of, of Anne Frank, who's actually a Jewish girl hiding under the Nazi um, persecution. Okay? So from there, from reading that diary of Anne Frank, that piece of literature, you can actually have a glimpse of the life of the Jewish people during that time. Okay? And number nine is literature is also a means of education and enlightenment. And the fact that you gain from reading, that means you class are, or you guys are learning from it. Okay? Now let's continue. What is literary appreciation now? That, now that we have already defined literature, let's talk about literary appreciation. Literary appreciation is the ability to study understand and evaluate or make a critical judgment of literary works. In fact, the fact that you are writing an opinion about a certain piece, that means you learn to appreciate a piece of literature. So it focuses on the adequate grasp of the definitions and applications or applications of traditional literary devices such as plot, character, metaphor, setting and symbolism, and other literary devices which may be encountered within the text. So the writing styles of the author, even the literary devices applied by him or her, that are visible in the literary work are considered and studied through the use of literary appreciation. Ogan Lowy, posits that literary appreciation refers to the evaluation of works of imaginative literature as an intellectual and academic exercise. Moreover, Donaldson and Nielsen echo this sentiment and add that it is a process by which one gauges or measures one interpretative response as a reader to a literary work. That is why I always tell my students, it's okay that your reaction to a specific literary piece is different, different from that of, of your classmates, okay? It's actually correct. I mean, it's, it's actually accepted. So this means, uh, this means that the reader is able to gain pleasure and understanding for the literature, understand its value, and importance and admire its complexity. Appreciating literary works can be considered as a lifelong process. And to give more clarity, Donaldson and Nielsen devised the literary appreciation occurs that, uh, sorry, that literary appreciation occurs in seven different stages. So what are these stages? So let's, let, let's check. There are actually seven stages. So the first stage is the pleasure and profit. So it's actually evident in, you know, children ages zero to five. So they're actually preschoolers. So literature can refer to oral manifestation. Literary appreciation is, is a social experience. So I hope that there are preschool teachers here. So imagine class, uh, I, mean, I mean, fellow teacher, sorry, I always um, address you as a class. I mean, as, as my students, rather. So um, in this stage or level, the kids are, I mean, do not know yet how to read. But actually, they are having fun listening to, to, um, to songs and listening to you as you read them their favorite, you know, um, stories. Now, the level two is actually the beginning of the development or the, of literacy development. This is the time when, when students learn how to read, learn to recognize the letters and um, recognize the words and, you know, um, enrich their vocabulary. Level three is when reading becomes a means of escaping. So this one. So this time... The students get themselves engaged in reading. 
Okay, that's why there's some students who are, you know, like instead of instead of playing video games, um, playing with their, you know, with their friends and cousins, they opt to read their favorite books. Okay, now what's level four? This is actually the time when we, as readers, we find ourselves, you know, after engaging ourselves too much in reading, we discover our identity. Okay, we get too more hooked to reading materials because, because you know, by reading those reading materials, we actually realize something, okay, about ourselves. Now, what is level five? This is the venture beyond self. You go beyond and you are able to assess the world around you. Okay, I hope that you can see the pattern. And the level six and level six and seven are evident in individuals ages 18 and above. But let's talk about the higher level, which is level six. This time we are too engaged in reading and we are what? We, we are able to appreciate varieties or different genres of literature. We read widely and we read widely and we discuss experiences with fears. Like, you know what? I've actually read this novel and I like this so much because I learned the, the culture of Americans and Europeans. And perhaps you can also read it. I can give you a copy or something like that. Okay. So, you know, from, from, um, from, from um, engaging in reading, you are now able to discuss the, the, the values um, embedded in that literary piece with your, with your friends, with your peers. And the last one is you read it. I mean, you read different literary um, pieces for aesthetic purposes. This is the time when you become an avid reader and you appreciate the artistic value of reading. So that's actually, these are the stages of literary appreciation. So I would like to know on the chat box, on the live chat, could you please write your level there so I can check it later once we're done already with our webinar. So I think because I am a teacher and I love also to read, I think I'm already in level seven. Okay. So if I have here some students, I actually saw one of my students. Um, his name actually appears on the live chat. His name is Christopher. I think he's already in level six. He's also a future teacher. By the way, I would like to say hi to my fellow teachers who are tuning in with us and to my to my relatives who are with us this afternoon. I mean this evening. Now what is literary appreciation? Let's let's um let's um dig deeper into it. Nicker Bucker and Raichik assert that, sorry for that, it's assert that it is important to understand. Literary development, the teacher should consider the stages of development and select materials and methods appropriate to them. That is why, my fellow teachers, there is actually what? There is a big um, responsibility placed upon our shoulders, especially in teaching literature. We have to consider actually the three laws of learning of Thorndike. So I believe that all of you can still remember the three laws of learning of Thorndike. Number one is the, the, the law of readiness. The second one is law of exercise. And the last one is law of effect. So if your students are in level one, so I don't think we can give our students you know, a reading material that is intended for college. So it's actually a mortal sin, okay, teachers. The next one is this sentiment is supported by PJ's stages of cognitive development at which children are said to go through mental development at different stages, which is actually true. Each level must provide a sense of satisfaction for the reader if he or she is expected to move on to the next stage. I just would like to give my, my fellow teachers a piece of advice. We cannot actually expect our students who are in high school to be at a certain level, okay? It's actually a normal that, 
that we're expecting them to be in level six or level four, but they are still in level two. Okay, that's actually normal. And that's when our, you know, our eagerness to help our students actually come into play. We have to apply scap scaffolding. Okay, that's actually from Vygotsky. So let's continue. Now, what is the importance of literary appreciation? Sir Emil, why do I have to develop among my students the, the literary appreciation skills? My dear fellow teachers, it is actually paramount, okay? Because whether they like it or not, our students sooner or later will engage themselves in reading, okay? Literary appreciation is alienable part of literature, and we cannot actually do away with that. In the same vein, it is importance, its importance to, to the understanding of literature, its benefits, and the literary works can be overemphasized um, as it is. Now, what are these importance of literary appreciation? Let's talk about proper evaluation. One of the importance of literature is that it allows proper evaluation of literary works, okay? Um, I remember when I was in elementary, my teacher would only give us five questions. And what are these questions? They would only revolve around what, who, when, where, and then why. And it's kind of boring, <laughs> okay? So... So what's the catch? After having our students learn or give the answers to those questions, then what's the catch? What will happen next? Did they get anything from it? Did they learn about, you know, something about, you know, values formation and so on and so forth? So I think we need to consider that too. The second one is connection between the readers and writers. I remember, I remember what my professor in MA said that, you know, sooner or later we will all die, which is actually true. You know, that's a time we will die when our, our body, our energy have finally deteriorated. We will all die. But you become actually an immortal, you know, being when you publish something. So, Emil, how is that? Will I still be able to talk to my to my um to my readers if i am already dead so well the answer is figuratively yes okay but not literally because it's going to be very creepy so when we say connection between the readers and writers there is actually a line that connects you and then your reader the fact that people or readers read your reading materials, the, the stories and novels that you have published, there is already a connection between you and your readers, okay? And that's actually the reason why Maya Angelou, a feminist, Kate Chopin, another fe a feminist, who else? You know, um, William Shakespeare are still famous these days because of their um, classic um what do you call that? Literary works, okay? We call them classic. It's because there are perennial knowledge and ideas that are embedded or depicted in their literary works, okay? The third one is that it gives more value. Another importance of, of um, literary appreciation is that through such attempt of evaluation, literary works become actually more valuable, okay? So... I remember last year, one of the topics that I discussed with my students was the works of William Shakespeare, and we talk about Romeo and Juliet. And even up to this day, that, that um, literary work is still famous. It's still relevant. It's because of the values that are embedded there. Okay, number four is information and imagination. Um, literary appreciation basically helps us to have the full grasp of the informative and imaginative aspects of, of literature. So I, I hope that 
these benefits are clear to everyone. Proper evaluation, connection between the readers and writers. So let me challenge you if you want to be known, you know, if you want to be remembered someday, even though you're already dead, then write a piece of literature and publish it. It gives more value and it's for information and imagination. But note for my fellow literature teachers, developing literary competence is one of the most important outcomes of teaching, teaching literature. Like what I said, we cannot just confine ourselves on teaching them the WA questions, okay? We need to make sure that our students will have this what we call enduring understanding. My dear fellow teachers, when we say enduring understanding, let's define first the word enduring. It's actually long lasting, okay? The long lasting knowledge is actually under the, that is actually under the principle of philosophy of perennialism, right? And existentialism, if I may say. So there, I remember my I remember my research teacher in qualitative research. Um, his name is Dr. Lino. I I actually worked under him. According to him, there are three different types of reading. Okay, this is different from scheming, scanning, and thorough reading. But when we say uh, it, it, in um, in qualitative research, there are actually three. The first one is reading the line. The second one is reading between the lines. And the third one is reading beyond the line. So if you're going to ask our students the questions, what, who, where, whom, where, or did I forget something? We are just letting our students to read the lines. But when we allow our students to to uh, make inferences and draw conclusion in the end and analyze the literature based on their own feelings, then we are letting them read beyond the lines, okay? So I hope that is clear to everyone. This refers to students internalizing the grammar of literature, which, which allows them to convert linguistic um, sequences into literary structures and meanings. Um, language and literature are actually congruent. When I say congruent, they are inseparable. And they are actually working together. So when I say linguistic sequences, we're talking about the richness of vocabulary and the meaning of symbols within the text. And we're also talking about the semantic and syntactic structure of the text. Now, when we say um, literary criticism, it is actually a platform by or through which the students can apply their language skills. Okay? So the essence of literature offers students an opportunity to perceive and evaluate their own worth as individuals. Okay? I mentioned a while ago the philosophy existentialism. So let's move on. I have already consumed um, the first 30 minutes of my time. So I hope that I can finish it in, in one hour or one and a half hours. Now let's talk about the different literary appreciation scales. We have already de defined literature. We've defined already literary appreciation. Now let's talk about the different literary appreciation scales. So I actually got it from, from the research conducted by Sir Gilbert C. Magulo Jr. He's a Filipino. Developing literary competence is one of the most important reasons for literature teaching. This refers to the ability of the students to internalize the grammar of literature, like what I said a while ago. So now what are these literary appreciation skills that we need to develop among students? There are actually four identified literary scales, and these are the following. The first one is recognizing the point of view used by the author. I believe you can still remember those um, um, points of view. We have the, what, what are those? We have the 
first person point of view. We have the third person omniscient, and then we also have the limited. Actually, we also have the second person point of view, right? The second one is recognizing imagery employed by the author. This is very important because it's actually through imagery that we drive our students through, you know, to, to read using their imagination. Like what I would always tell our, my students, because I'm also a reading teacher. Um, if you fail to imagine the scenes in the story, that means you have already failed reading. It's because how are you going to understand a, a fantasy novel without really trying to picture out what's happening there? So it's going to be very difficult, okay? Now, recognizing how the characters are introduced. Number four is recognize the prime scheme used by the author. Sir Emil, what do we mean by prime scheme? So scheme actually refers to a strategy or a style of the author in helping, um, um, what do you call that? In organizing and in orchestrating the relationship with the readers. A while ago, I mentioned that that um, there is a connection between the reader and then the author, okay? So when we say prime scheme or recognizing the prime scheme, we are driving our students at identifying the style of the author, establishing the, the rapport between the author or the writer and then the readers themselves. So there are actually, it's for social interaction, by the way. Now, through, rhyme, through prime scheme, the author is able to signal formality. Is it high, middle, or low? Next, the author is also able to control emotional intensity of prose. Okay? And the last one is the author is able to showcase his wit and command over his or her medium. Okay? The fifth one is recognizing the purpose of the title. The fifth one or the sixth one is recognizing the parts of the plot. So I think we know already the different types or the different elements of plot from the exposition to the denouma. Okay. And then the, determining the tone, the mood, and then the style of the author and recognizing evidence, proving a, a universal truth or philosophy. It's actually a lot. Next is judging the text in which generalizations, assumptions, hypotheses, theories, and arguments are formed, relating the story to their lives, which is actually very important. You know, it's actually a matter of, of putting themselves in the shoes of the characters so they will be able to establish or to experience vicariously the experience of the characters, which is also key to understanding a particular literary piece. Next is finding answers to a question or a solution to a lifetime problem, recognizing personal philosophy based on the theme of the solution, and coming up with enrichment activities like artworks, creative um, dramatics, story writing, puppetry, and the like, based on the selection to read. So here in this, um, this skill, is actually key to producing something. Like, for example, after having my students read a particular literary text, what's next? Am I going to create, am I going to ask my students to, to create, a, what do you call that? To dramatize it? Am I going to ask my students to come up with a report, to come up with analysis of it, something like that? So remember that our goal is actually to ask our students to create something. And the last one is concretizing the imagery of language used by the author in the story. So these are the different literary appreciation skills that we need to develop among our students. Okay. Now, what are the issues in terms of learners' literary appreciation skills? Um, in Saudi Arabia, Al Shamari conducted a research entitled Challenges to Studying English Literature 
by Saudi undergraduate English as a foreign language student as perceived by the instructor. So he found out that learners prefer to avoid studying English literature due to several challenges that may be uh, that may extend from difficulties inherited in literature itself to the learning and instructional processes. And this problem is actually um, rampant in countries where English is not the L1 or language one. Okay? So most in Asian countries and perhaps in also in also some in some European countries. Now he has actually found out that these are the different types of challenges. Number one, literature inherited difficulty, learners' cultural misconceptions, learners' negative attitudes. That's correct. Um, we cannot actually, um, sometimes it's the interest of the students who's the main problem. If the student is not really interested in a particular literary piece, asking them to read it would be very difficult. And it's actually the option to it. Learners' intrinsic demotivating factors. Number five is unfamiliarity or the learner's prior uh, or poor prior knowledge. Yes, that's important schema. And of course, instructional difficulty. So as you can see, my dear um, fellow teachers, these are the challenges that we have to address as, you know, as literature teachers, okay? So our student is also a factor. Our, our um, curriculum designs may also be a factor, but there is a big responsibility, this responsibility that is, you know, that are on our shoulders. So let's continue. So what is the conclusion and what are the recommendations? Number one is a set of challenges that were mostly attributed to learners themselves were revealed. So um, the interest of the students, the... Motivation is also a factor. However, the researchers also believe that in order to address these issues, responsibility should be shared among the learners themselves, the teachers themselves, and of course, the curriculum designers. Therefore, the curricula should include well-designed and sequenced literature texts and activities that take into account the, the difficulty level of this text and the current learner's abilities and proficiency levels. But Sir Ingram, I have a question. You're talking about the interest of the students. What if, what if um, the literary texts that they don't like are part of the curriculum? What am I going to do? That's actually a very good question. Then, it's already your call as a teacher, okay? It's, well, it's your problem, but I do believe that you could do something about it. You need to scaffold learning. How? Your target is actually the heart of your reader. I remember I was once asked by a, by a, a lecturer in one of our webinars, in one of the webinars that I attended, I just forgot the specific question. But my answer was, I, as a listener, sometimes I'm challenged to listen. But if the topic appeals to my heart, then I would be engaged in listening to that topic. I will be able to listen even though it's, you know, it's for two hours. Okay? The tendency if our students do not know the importance of this literary text, the students would actually despise it. They won't listen at all. But if they are already directed and they, it's clear to them the core values that are embedded in this literary text, then they would be driven to, to read, okay? So um, 
I remember a very um, a very compelling, a very a very good statement begins with the end in mind, and that is why before we ask our students to read a particular literary text, we already need to lay down to them the perennial knowledge and ideas that we will gain from reading such text. Okay, so let's continue. Um, since our we are catering to 21st century learners, let's have a review. Let's define a 21st century learner. Number one, a learner, this learner is self-directed, globally aware, communicator, problem solver, a critical thinker, civically engaged, a collaborator, information and media literate, and financially, economically literate, and an innovator. So, Mr. Emil Yakon, why do we have to why do we have to get to know what a 21st century learner is? It's because their needs are actually high. Their standards are also high, and there is actually a, a compelling call for us to respond or to meet those standards. Okay? And um, yeah. So let's continue. I, I, I kept on, or I keep on um, mentioning two educational philosophies, perennialism and existentialism. Yeah, it's because these um, educational philosophies are, are um, what do you call that, are applied, should I say, in in literary criticism, okay, in, in, you know, in reading, okay, in teaching literature. Now let's talk about perennialist view in developing the literary appreciation skills among our students. So perennialists believe that the focus of education should be the ideas that have lasted over centuries. They believe that ideas are as relevant and meaningful today as when they were written. They recommend that students learn from reading and analyzing the works by history's finest thinkers and writers. That's actually the reason why even up to this day, even though William Shakespeare has been dead for how many years, we are still, you know, we're still discussing all his works. It's because of the it's because of the of the knowledge and ideas, the values that are embedded in his works, because those actually transcend time. Okay? They remain classic. Now, a perennialist classroom aims at um, or aims to be a closely organized and well-disciplined environment which develops um, in students a lifelong quest for the for the truth. Okay, so by the way, perennialism is, um, what do you call that? It's actually about inculcating ideas that, that, that transcend time. Whereas when we say existentialism, it, it, it actually focuses on assisting our students as they pursue moral or as they pursue, you know, um, understanding themselves and discovering their moral purpose in life. Um, so let's continue. I hope you can still, um, what do you call that? You still grasp? You can still grasp the things that I am discussing with you tonight? Perennialists believe that education should epitomize a prepared effort to make these ideas available to students and to guide their thought processes toward or towards the understanding and appreciation of great works. Works of literature written by history's finest thinkers that transcend time and never become outdated. Existentialists believe that when students study these works and ideas, they will appreciate learning. And similar to perennialism, existentialism aims to develop students' intellectual and moral qualities. Okay, so there. 
Now, because the title of our seminar or webinar is Enhancing the Literary Appreciation Skills of the 21st Century Learners Through Literary Criticism, we are going to define this variable, which is literary criticism, because in this webinar, literary criticism is sought to address the issue, which is how to enhance the student's literary appreciation skills. Now, what is literary criticism? And Sir Emil, what's the difference between literary appreciation and literary criticism? So we're going to unfold the answer to that question after we define literary criticism. Literary criticism is basically the comparison, analysis, interpretation, and evaluation of works of literature supported by evidence relating to the different literary devices and, and literature elements. It broadens a reader's understanding of an author's work by analyzing not only the literary piece, but also revisiting the life of the author and even the time or the year or the era when this piece of literature actually emerged. So the practice of literary criticism creates a space for the readers to better understand the beauty of such literature in its complexity or the complexity of the world through literature. Now, what is the difference between literary appreciation and literary criticism? The answer is there is actually a gray line that separates the two. They're congruent, they're inseparable, they're always together. It's because it is a through literary appreciation that a student can critic a literary piece. Without appreciating a piece of literature, it would be difficult for a certain individual to critic a particular literary piece. So literary appreciation is its goal is actually for pleasure, while literary criticism seeks to understand why and how a particular literary work works, how it emerged, how is the life of the author um, related to the emergence of that literary piece? Does it have anything to do with the, with, with the history? So those are the questions that you that, that we actually ask normally when we critic a certain literary piece, okay? So this time, let's go back to the types of reading that I mentioned a while ago. We read the lines, we read between the lines, and we read beyond the lines. So in this case, when we critic a particular literary piece, we actually apply any of those types of reading. So I hope that you can still follow. Now, what are the different literary or what are the different approaches in literary criticism? After discussing or defining literary criticism and talking about a difference between literary appreciation and literary criticism, we are now going to dive deeper into it. We're going to talk about a different approaches in literary criticism. And we are actually very lucky because a famous, a famous um, um, modern author whose name is um, Skylar Hamilton Burris, he's just actually able, she was able to, to um, prepare a literary criticism map. And it actually looks this way. So as you can see, the work itself is in the middle because all these approaches may be applied in critiquing or analyzing such literary texts. Sir Emil, how come there are arrows? And why is psychological approach or psychoanalytic approach is there outside? So what's the difference among these literary approaches? So don't worry, we're going to answer those questions. So let me continue. Let's talk about the first 
literary approach. So time check, it's already 6.50. I still have 10 minutes. I hope I can, I will be able to finish all this stuff before 7.30. So let's talk about the first approach in literary criticism, which is formalist criticism. So the root word of formalist criticism or formalist is form. So when we say form, we are talking about the physical structure of something. So in this case, we're going to talk about the physical structure of a text or of a, of a literary of a literary piece. Okay. So here we are going to set aside the other considerations. We don't care about the life of the author. We don't care about the real world. We don't care about I don't care about myself when I'm when I'm reading, okay? I should not be influenced by my emotion, by my own opinion. I don't care about the other literature, pieces of literature. I'm not going to intertextualize. So meaning to say the meaning of a certain literary text is inherent within it. We don't care about the other considerations because meaning according to to um, formalists, meaning is determinant, and other considerations are irrelevant. Okay? Now, what is deconstructionism or deconstructionist criticism? Somehow, it is, it's somehow the same with formalist criticism, okay? But, of course, they are, they are different. Here, there is no meaning in language. It's because the meaning of a literary piece depends on the reader. So the meaning itself is dependent on the reader. Okay? That's why I mentioned a while ago that it's okay, it is normal that my understanding of this literary piece is different from your understanding. It's actually normal. Okay? Now let's continue. So, Emil, how about historical criticism and biographical criticism? So, this time, we talk about the life of the author and the author's world. Like, for example, um, mm, I believe you're familiar with George Orwell. George Orwell is the, is the author of Animal Farm. Animal Farm is actually a dystopian fable. When we say dystopian fable, it is actually such a fable has characters which are animals, but these animals have their own society. That's what we call dystopian fable. Okay? So perhaps, I will use the word perhaps. Perhaps there is a reason why George Orwell was able to, to compose or to produce such novel, okay? Perhaps history compelled him to do it, okay? Or maybe John Keats, a famous poet, the poet who wrote Ode to a Nightingale, experienced something in the past, and that led him to produce such wonderful literary piece. In the historical view, it's important to understand the author himself and this world in order to understand the emergence of that literary piece, okay? It's because the author's beliefs, his judgment, even the era when he wrote it have actually something to do with the author, okay? So there. Next, let's talk about the other one. Let's talk about intertextual criticism. Okay. So um, I remember when I was when I was in my MA, I had to study two different literary pieces in order for me to address or to answer my assumption, my hypothesis. Or my hypothesis. Sir Emil, what is intertextualizing? It's actually when you look 
at different or multiple documents in order for you to come up with the synthesis. And that synthesis will answer your one big question, your hypothesis. Okay? It is actually concerned with comparing the work in question to other literature. One may compare a piece of work to another of the same author, same literary movement, or the same historical background. If I may just give an example, I do believe that you know, um, you know Leo Tolstoy is actually a Russian author. You may, you may, you may, um, you may talk. You may read *War and Peace* and the the Anna Karenina. You may compare them and then check their common denominator. This is actually what we call intertextualizing or intertextual intertextualized um, crit literary criticism. Now, shall we move on to the next literary criticism approach? Read the response criticism. So it's actually concerned with how the work is viewed by the audience. Now, this time, my dear fellow teachers, my dear audience, your response to literature is now influenced by your own experience, by your own opinion, and by your own feeling. Now, if I am a teacher, I'm not going to... I'm not really going to give you a grade according to your opinion. It's not like that. But if I were your teacher, I am going to give you a grade based on how you expound your opinion, based on the number of or the piece of evidence that you that you um, write in your in your analysis. So once the work is published, the author is no longer relevant. Okay. So there. Let's continue. The next, the next um, literary approach or criticism approach is the mimetic, a mimetic criticism, which actually means when we say mimetic, um, mimetic um, approach, we actually view a literary piece as in as an imitation of of a world, of a certain world. I mentioned a while ago the, you know, the work of the work of George Orwell, The Animal Farm. It may be a dystopian fable because that society is participated by animals, but you know what? It actually depicts a real world, and that is the Russian Revolution. Okay? We're in um, you know, the social classes. There is um, what do you call that? There is segregation. Correct me. Correct, please correct me if, with, with my term. You know, the, the low class, what else? The, the bourgeoisie, those things. Now, let's talk about the other one. I do believe that you know Kate Chopin. Kate Chopin is actually a feminist, okay? Her works are also subject to feminism um, criticism. But actually, her works may also be analyzed through this literary criticism approach, the psychoanalytic and then psychological criticism. It's because it attempts to explain the behavioral underpinnings of the characters within a selection. It analyzes their, you know, their actions, even their language. So aside from the characters, the author and even the reader may be criticized as to why they exhibit certain behavior during the actual writing and reading experience. I am not really so sure if, if once in your life you came across the work of Kate Chopin. One of my favorite, one of my favorite um, works of Kate Chopin is the story of, of an hour. It's a very nice, um, it's a very nice short story. It represents the narrator's perspective about, you know, about her marriage, specifically, you know, um, the fact that she is not really contented with her marriage at all. So there, it's actually influenced by, by Fro Sigmund Freud's um, um, id, ego, and um, superego. Okay, that's, yeah, that's why Kate Chopin's works are very good, you know, for, for um, literary criticism. 
while you apply this, this approach. The next one is the archetypal criticism. So archetypal assumes or criticism uh, assumes that there is a collection of symbols, images, characters, and motives that evoke the same response in all people, which seems to bind all people, regardless of culture and race worldwide. So, like, for example, perhaps you have your, your ideal character. Perhaps you're telling yourself, you know what? In my next life, I want to be like this person because he or she is my role model. Or perhaps I would like to make my I would like to write my own novel and then this will be my this will be my uh, what do you call that? This will be my um I will be this character and these will be my 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 my, my characteristics. Okay? So I remember I remember Carl Jung. Carl Jung is actually the proponent of the Jungian. Um, archetypes because according to him there are four different archetypes number one is the persona second is the shadow and the third one is the the other uh, only three the, the the third one is what i actually like the anima or or animus wherein um you know they are the reflection of an opposite gender and then they are actually ideal Okay, so there. Um, let's continue. So basically, we look up to those characters. Number number seven, is it number seven? Or the next one is what we call Marxist criticism. So what is Marxist criticism? It's actually concerned with the analysis of the clash of opposing social classes in society, namely the ruling class, the bourgeoisie, and the working class, the proletariat as it shaped the events that transpired in the history. If I may share the same example, is the animal farm of George Orwell, okay? So let me continue. What is feminism criticism? I do believe that you know Maya Angelou. I hope I can see your live chat, your messages on the live chat. Maya Angelou, is a was a black American. Okay, she's actually a famous feminist. Okay, a famous poet, and I really love her so much. One of the one of the works of Maya Angelou is is still I rise. Okay, so I I I I I, I love her so much when she said that that um there are some people who are actually so afraid by or afraid of empowered women. They are, they are fearful because they're haughty. When we say haughty, they are fearsome, you know? For others, they may appear so rude, but actually they're not. They're just, you know, they're just, um, what do you call that? They are empowered. They speak their mind. So, yeah. Okay, so that's what we call feminist criticism. It's concerned with the women's role in society as portrayed through texts. It typically analyzes the plight of women as depicted in the story. Generally, it criticizes the notion of women as a construct through literature. So I hope that you were able to grasp those literary uh, criticism approaches and how they're applied. Though the question is, Mr. Emil Yakon, you've mentioned a lot of, of um, literary criticism approaches. What is the best literary criticism approach? Now, the answer is, there is no best approach, my dear fellow teachers. That is why the literary criticism map is projected that way. There is only suitable and most appropriate literary criticism approach, but there is no best. Okay, Sir Emil, how may I know or how will I know if this is the best approach? Well, you have to ask yourself, what is my purpose of coming up with a literary analysis? You have to ask yourself first, okay? If your reason, if your purpose is to 
to identify the the relevance of a historical event in literature in that piece of literature then you have to go for historical approach okay now sir Emil, i just would like my students to you know to share their take on a specific literary piece then you may go for deconstructionist criticism or read the response um, literary criticism approach okay sir Emil, i would like to see if my students um, can fight for what they you know believe in especially these days that we experience discrimination different forms of discrimination so what do you think is the best or the most appropriate literary approach or literary criticism approach, then it could be feminist um, criticism approach. Okay, Sir so, Emil, I would like to I would like to analyze the, this novel, and you would like to see the you know the the line that separates the rich and poor. So I believe that you know the answer. It could be the Marxist criticism approach. So I hope that you were able to grasp all these things. Now, this time, I would like to, to unravel the mystery. So, Emil, what is the explanation behind the literary criticism map? So this is the explanation. I, I just wrote everything here so you can digest it properly. The work itself is placed in the center because, well, it's the meat of the literary analysis. We are talking about the literary text, okay? Formalism, deconstructionist, uh, or deconstruction are placed here as they deal primarily with the text. And they are, they don't care about the other considerations, okay? They don't care, they don't care about the real world. They don't care about the author. They don't care about themselves. Okay, it, I don't care as, as a person who analyzes the text, I don't care now about my, my own prejudice. I just care about the literary piece there. Now, meaning formalists argue or mean, the meaning as what the formalists argue is inherent in the text. It's because meaning is determinant. The construction is also subject um, also subject text to careful formal analysis. However, they reach an opposite conclusion. There is no meaning in language. In historical view, it is important to understand the author, the author and his word in order to understand his intent and to make sense of his work. Okay? That is why there is a, it's actually paramount to understand the life of the author and then to understand the era when it was created or composed or written. An intertextual, an intertextual approach is concerned with comparing different works. Whereas when we say reader response, it is concerned with how the readers actually view a particular literary um, piece. In this approach, the reader creates meaning and not the author or the work. Okay? So the understanding of the audience or of the reader is highly influenced by his opinion, judgment, or emotions or feelings. Now then beyond the real world, now this is the application of reading beyond the lines. Beyond the world, the approach is dealing with the spiritual and symbolic. The images connecting people throughout the time and cultures. This is mimetic in a sense too, but the congruency look for its, for it, congruency look for is not so much with the real world. As with something beyond the real world, something trying in all worlds, times, uh, cultures, inherited or inhabited by men. So another one is, sir, email, how come the psychological approach is placed outside that cross? It's placed outside 
because it can fit in many places depending on how it is applied. Number one, historical in diagnosing the, the, the author himself, Mimedic, if it if considering if characters are acting the real world standards and with recognizable psycho psychological motivations and archetypal or archetypal archetypal with the idea of the Jungian collective unconscious is included. This actually um uh, it's actually coined by Carl um, Jungian or Ka Carl Jung and with the response when the psychology of the reader why he sees what he sees in the text and then, you know, examine. Now I'll continue. Let's continue. Now, how can literary criticism enhance literary appreciation scales? Number one, it expands the learner's worldview by examining the works of literature through um, different approaches to literary criticism. Learners expand their understanding of the world and it helps learner better understand literature. Learner or literary criticism can give them the tools to study, evaluate, and interpret literary works such as novels, short stories, and poems. And writing a critical essay or a book review about a particular piece of literature, reading other examples of literary criticism can help them learn how to frame their point of view. And lastly, it provides opportunities for new styles of writing. And with a vast number of approaches, the practice of literary criticism creates space and context for authors to create works of literature that push boundaries and break new creative ground. So there. So it's actually beneficial to engage our students in literary criticism in enhancing their literary appreciation skills. So I hope that you learned from our um, webinar this evening. Thank you so much for listening. This is Mr. Emil Yacon. Once again, I'm from the Philippines, and I hope that you learned from our webinar entitled Enhancing the Literary Appreciation Skills of the 21st Century Learners Through Literary Criticism. So thank you so much to all my fellow Filipino teachers who are with us right now. I also saw um, some, some um, comments from, from teachers of different nationalities. There are Indonesians, um, um, Pakistani, and um, Indian. So thank you so much. Kindly write um, the country where you're coming from right now so I can personally thank you after this after this webinar through the live chat. Thank you so much, um, Sir, Sir Adil. I'm now giving you the floor. Perhaps our audience have some questions and um, I'll try my best to answer those questions. Thank you so much. Sir Adil? Sir? Yes, sir. Yeah, so I'm finally done with my presentation. Thank you so much, sir. It was really wonderful. It was very detailed and it was amazing presentation given by you. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. your time and uh, for this wonderful presentation. So now, guys, I, uh, we are moving towards a question and answer session. Sir, you may take a two minutes break and then we will start the question and answer session. Okay, sir? Yes, sir. You're welcome, Thank you. sir. Thank you so much also for the opportunity to share Most with our welcome. audience the, you know, some knowledge that I have gained in my teaching career. Thank you. Sir, do I have permission to share your slides with the audience? Because some uh, participants were asking for it. Yeah, it's okay, sir. You want me to? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, perhaps I can... Um, I can share with you via email the yes, the the PDF copy of my presentation. It's okay, and sir, I also just would like to um to um what do you call that to tell this to our audience. If yeah, I'm actually very much willing to share with you my simple knowledge. If okay, you sir. um if you're looking for a speaker, then I yeah, I'm very much okay, willing. Sir. To take Thank you so much. Most welcome. So, uh, guys, this is our email. If you need a uh, Slides, you may email us. 
you may email us then we will send you the slides on through this email okay yes so do they have some questions sir perhaps they can yes, answer sir. yes sir yes sir yes sir so guys now uh, please ask the questions from our speaker if you have any question regarding the topic Yes, we are going to share the feedback form link after the question and answer session. Yes, sir. My apologies, I cannot access my YouTube right now because, um, yeah, as it might create a problem. Uh, sir, can you repeat? What did you say? Yeah, I, I cannot actually see the questions of the audience okay. on the live chat because I can't really open it now because okay. there, might, there might be a competition with the, you know, with the sound, with the audio. I guess so there are really no questions, but um, yeah. And also yes, I would like have. to ask about your personal techniques, how you teach your literature, how you teach literature, especially in the pre-reading part. How do you, um, what do you usually do, sir? Um, this is a very nice question. What are my personal techniques? You know what? Um, it actually depends on the type of students I'm handling. Um I always pose a very, uh, what do you call that? A mind tickling question. Sir, Emil, what do you mean by mind tickling, uh, tickling question? It is actually a question that would drive my students to think critically. You know, um, another one is I always start with, with um, discussing the life of, of the author. But, but normally, I let my students to, to, to read, you know, to discover the, the life of the author. I let, them, I, I let them read and what else. I also make them, um, what do you call that? Make their own questions. And then these questions will be answered by them at the end of the, of the discussion, the end of the, yeah, the lesson. So something like that. But sometimes I also, I also present some videos. Yeah, to my students but giving them questions is actually the best but it depends actually on the age of the students remember we have to consider the different levels of our students the levels of the students in terms of literary appreciation okay so of course if it's level one our students are not really expected to read you know, L1, the students just enjoy listening to songs, to um, listening to their favorite stories read by their, um, by their um, parents and then teachers. So the best thing to do is actually to show them something that they can watch and then ask them about how they, I mean, what they understood in that, um, you know, I mean, from watching that um, from video or something like that. So there. So actually there are different um, strategies um, that we can um, apply in teaching literature. So more, sir. So I hope I was able to answer your question. I'm actually overwhelmed because the 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 answer to that is we really have to consider the level of our students in terms of literary appreciation. Okay. So do we have other questions? Yes. So yes. I'm yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So I think I was able to answer that question. It's the same. So again, number one is, you know, we teachers must be familiar with, with the background of our students. If you know that our students has, our students have problem with, you know, with, um, with reading comprehension, so I think we need to scaffold learning for them. We need to provide a lot of activities 
what do you call that? Like number one, like what I said, um, um, we may post questions. We may um, we may uh, show them uh, videos. What else? Yeah, those things. How can a 21st century learners become literary critical in form in context in content given the conditions of technology, especially social media platforms today? You know what? That's a very um, difficult question, but you know what? I like the way you phrase it. Um, I guess along with the advancement of technology is actually the, the, the deterioration of students' interest in reading. And it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's really challenging to divert the attention of the students back to, you know, to reading, okay? But like what I said, we always let our students understand the importance of reading this particular literary piece. We have to discuss with our students the core values that they may get from this from this literary piece. What values are embedded in this literary piece? Because if a literary piece has, I mean, you know, appeals to the heart, then it's going to be the it's going to be easier for us to hook our students to literary. Um, what do you call that? To hook our students to engage themselves in in um, literary. Um, Analysis or literary criticism. I hope I was able to give your your answer. I mean, I was. I, I hope I was able to answer your question. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, this is from Nayab. I read Oxford's learning strategies for learning languages like cognitive, metacognitive, social, and affective strategies. So we can use these strategies in order to analyze literary texts and how, you know, yes, of course, we can actually, um, we can apply these strategies in, in, um, in teaching literature, specifically in teaching our students to learn, to, to analyze literature. Like what I said a while ago, um, if you're asking me what is the best approach or literary criticism approach um, to apply in literary criticism, my answer is there's no best approach. However, there is an appropriate one. Now you have to go back to your, you have to go back to your, um, what do you call that? As a reader, okay, not as a teacher. You have to go back to your purpose as a reader and then as a right as an analyst okay because you're the one who's analyzing you have to ask yourself what is my what is my um what is my objective what is my purpose am i here to am i here to um to um to discover how uh how the history um how am i going to say it if, 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 for example, if my purpose is to check the relevance of this particular era in the history with the emergence of the literary piece, then I have to go for a specific literary criticism approach. And I think that, um, yeah, I, I, I think, um, yeah, I think that, that that answers the question. Cognitive, metacognitive, social, and effective strategies. Okay. I hope I was able to give you um, the answer, though I know it's not really that concrete. So should we <coughs> move another yeah. question? So, yeah, I think I've given a very um, okay. ambiguous answer. But if you can actually provide your email address, I can give you the, the, the concrete answer. We have different students with different needs. How can we get away from the conventional way of explanation of literary criticism? Um, sir, actually, we don't really need to discuss with them literary criticism. What we need to do is to discuss with them 
or to help them understand a particular literary piece. Literary criticism is actually just a a gateway towards understanding a literary piece. But you know what, like what I said, um, we need to consider the levels of the students in terms of literary appreciation. So I think this is the time for us to apply differentiated curriculum. Differentiated curriculum. When I say differentiated curriculum, we are actually addressing the concern of the students. We are um, considering their special, their needs. Okay, and then from there, then we can actually come up with a very good, um, a very good, um, what do you call that? Um, should I say lesson? A lesson plan. For example, my students are not really into, into reading, but I want my students to, to critique this particular literary piece. But my student is actually, in, is actually um, you know, what do you call that? Into watching movies. Then I can actually look for a video clip or something like that. I hope I was able to answer your question. So my answer, Rolly Peralta, Mr. Rolly Peralta, is to apply this principle, to apply the differentiated curriculum. I hope I was able to answer. I guess this is also from a Filipino teacher. Considering that, that, that not all people are inclined to literature, yes, I must actually agree with that. I was once not really into reading. Is it okay to disregard books and focus on music and movies to help them appreciate it? Um, well, the answer is, I may be biased, but we cannot actually do away with letting our students read. It's because, you know, books are, you know, they're very important. You know, there are actually certain things that you cannot, that you might not be able to find in music or movies that are only found in in um in books okay like what i said a while ago uh, i um one of the one of the benefits of or the importance of of um, literary appreciation is that we as authors were able to create a connection with our readers okay and in that way we're able to immortalize ourselves so i don't think that i don't think that by disregarding I think by disregarding the books, we already what? We already burn the bridge that connects the readers and then the authors. It's because, you know what? Um, I also mentioned about the three different types of reading. The reading between the lines, the reading beyond the lines, the reading, reading the lines, reading, reading between the lines, and reading beyond the lines. If we are going to just let our students focus on music and then watch movies, then we fail to apply those different types of reading, okay? Um, remember that reading actually uh, provides lots of benefits. Number one, it is also what? It's also a form of social interaction, but it's also our escape from the stress in the world. So I guess that aside from, you know, Instead of thinking of disregarding the books, I think we need to we need to guide our students and learners towards you know realizing the importance of books in their lives, especially their students. They, they, they will never do away with that with, with, with reading. Sooner or later, our students will will have to engage themselves more and immerse themselves more in different literary works. There. So I hope I was able to answer your question. I you are just concerned with the future. Okay, sir. Could sir, could you explain st structuralist approach? Okay, sir. Um discussing that would entail more time, but but based on my I don't have actually the copy with me, but based on my understanding, because I was once able to you know, to, to, to study that before. The structure, the structure, structuralist approach is somehow, I use the word somehow because it's not, you know, absolutely the same, but correct me if I am wrong. I might be wrong. I am willing to be corrected. The, that approach is synonymous to the formalist approach. Yeah. 
you may correct me if I am wrong. Okay, do you have more questions? But I love the way the question is phrased. Yeah, it also drove me to think critically. Sir, do you think, uh, thank you so much, Alan Anwar Hassan, ma'am. Do you think group working can be applied with class literature? Yes, of course. You know what? Um, I'm actually teaching in senior high. Uh, no, in senior high, I mean in junior high school in grade 10. And I realized that my students are actually, what do you call, they enjoy more literature when they're able to exchange ideas with their classmates. And I think it's, you know, um, remember that one of the definitions one of the characteristics of a 21st century learner is that they are critical thinkers and they're collaborators. And I think group work, group work is actually a good way, a, a, good, a, group, a good activity, okay, that we may apply in teaching our students, you know, literature. Yeah, thank you for that question. I, I, I love the question. This is from a Filipino teacher, I, I suppose, Jeffrey um, Garretic. So you have mentioned about the level of literary appreciation among learners. My question is, how can we identify their level? Or what activity or test a teacher can provide to determine it? That's a good question. You know what? Um, I'm not so sure if you're familiar with Lexile, okay? Well, Lexile, uh, in, in, in the Philippines, specifically in our school, we use Lexile. It's actually a courseware for us, okay? But Lexile is more than just a courseware because Lexile is actually a unit or measurement, okay, to check the proficiency of a student in reading. Um, well, number one is we need to revisit the profile of the student, how you may actually check the data coming from the registrar. You may also check the anecdotal records prepared by the previous teacher. And then perhaps you can devise your own test to check the level of your student, okay, in terms of, um, what do you call that? In terms of um, 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 reading, okay? Or, though I have not come across with a sample yet, but I do believe that there are um, existing um, pre-tests or assessment, okay? to identify the level of the literary appreciation skills of our students. But if I were the student or if I were the teacher and I don't have the, the available um, assessments, what am I going to do is actually what? To conduct an investigation, to check the, the grade of the students, and then of course to check the anecdotal records prepared by the previous teacher. So that's actually the initial, that must be our initial plan. Okay, so thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. If you can recommend some literary piece for elementary grades, what would it be, sir? Um, Ninadel Mijares. Mom, you know what? That question may sound easy, but I think um, I cannot answer that question. There's so many good literary pieces available, okay? Um, but I think my piece of suggestion is before deciding on the literary piece to teach to our students as the springboard, I guess we need to check first the interest of the students because from there, when we already know the, the, the you know, the, the interest of the students and then their, their level, it would be easier for us to identify what literary piece would suit our elementary grade students or elementary students, okay? But, you know, in the Philippines, we already teach them poems. We already teach them stories, but not really the short stories because short stories, ironically, ironically, are not really short. They're somehow actually, they're actually longer than the regular short stories, okay? But um, perhaps, aside from um, considering their interests and then their level, I think you can, you, you can, you may let your students read literary pieces in their mother tongue. It will also help. But that is, your target is just to learn them to appreciate that literary piece. But if your target is to already develop um, 
what do you call that, the language skills of your students in English. So you may already, from time to time, you can already introduce to them different English or piece of literature in English. So I, I hope I was able to give you the answer. Okay, so I hope... <coughs> so, uh, guys, I have sent you a uh, feedback form link. So hope you have completed the form after that you will receive a certificate okay sir uh, we have uh, some more questions so would you like to answer them or should we end yeah um sir i would love to answer those questions actually i'm overwhelmed yeah by the okay. questions but i i hope i was able to give them the, the the answer to those questions but sir um if i may just um um suggest perhaps you can get the those questions and then okay. I can email the answers to you, and perhaps we can we can send them an email, okay, bearing okay. those answers to those questions. So, okay. sir, I just would like to personally thank the the um, the audience, you know, especially my fellow Filipinos who are um, tuning in. Uh, thank you so okay, much sir. for supporting me, and to you also, sir, for this opportunity. Okay, sir. So then, wish uh, I, we are going to end the session, sir. Uh, thank you so much for your time okay sir and guys uh okay sir. I, uh 23 sep uh 26 uh, sep september okay yeah. thank you so much sir and goodbye thank everyone. you so much thank you